Hi everyone, welcome, welcome, welcome to the Flying Changes show. I am thrilled today to have with me Ali Surrey Dane. Hi Ali. Hello. Ali, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself um, and what brings you on to us today. Um, so I work with horses now, um, but I did come from a more of a corporate background. Um, horses have always been my passion, but I, I went to university and did a business and hospitality degree. Um, and then I, we, I did start up a livery yard and start training and things, but then um, money side of it wasn't amazing when we bought our own place. Um, so I did go in and into the corporate world, um, which to be honest, I hated. Um, it was a kind of little bit of performance management, a lot of admin, um, and especially in the winter, I was in the dark from, you know, I was I was leaving the house in the dark and arriving back in the dark with no time to do my horses or anything. So I quit that. I decided to leave that. And I've since done all of my um, teaching qualifications. I now um, teach people of all levels in mainly in dressage now, but my background is eventing. Um, I previously evented with my horse up to intermediate and I think the old two star, I think it's now three star. And with the same horse, we're just hopefully about to go and do our first Grand Prix when we're allowed to out again. Um, and uh, now, you know, I run my own yard. We do a lot of rehab. Um, we have a lot of um, uh, competition liveries but the main thing is is that I look after I try and look after both the horse and the rider on the yard I don't just focus on the horse I focus on the rider which is probably why I've ended up um, trying to bring um, more, a more, a more of a focus I suppose onto the rider than the horse because we're absolutely inundated with every all kinds of things about horses all the time um but actually we neglect the the side of it um that the that the rider brings in awesome okay so that's fab and i love this uh, and you're very similar background to me um <laughs> corporate corporate uni corporate need the money and then go hang on a minute that's actually i could flip this the other way yeah. around and still enjoy myself and have my horses, which I was working really hard to have, but I actually don't yeah. need to do, because if I flip it the other way around, I could have both. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, you, so amazing, so fabulous, done that. Tell us more then about your why. Why do you feel it's so important then that we look at the rider and the horse and not just the horse? What's that about? Well, um... In, I think it was, it was about seven years ago, 2014, um, I, I very quietly, um, and nobody knew about it, very quietly and very slowly, had a little bit of a breakdown, um, but nobody knew about it. And I realised at the time is because I had kind of abandoned all of my core values. So, um, well, not abandoned completely, that's too strong a word, but... I certainly didn't have them at the forefront of my life. I'd lost all my creativity. Um, and by this point, I'd come out of um, the corporate world and I was trying, I was trying so hard to compete and so hard to be competitive with my horse um, and almost punishing myself for not working hard enough. My problem is that I, d I don't know when to stop working. Um, and, and my core values, which actually I've since identified um, having done quite... I suppose in the olden days we'd call it navel gazing, but now um, I know the value of looking at what drives me and what I feel is important to me. So things like integrity, 2013, 2014, I don't feel like I was true to them at all um, for various reasons. I was, I was surrounded by the wrong people. Um, myself too hard and I, I wasn't looking after my diet I think I lost um, I, I know now that my ideal weight is probably about um, it's probably about 63 kilos and I went down to 52 kilos probably in the space of about I don't know um, three months I think um, 
and that that was the only outward sign that something was a bit wrong with me even the people that I lived with didn't had no idea that I was struggling at all um so after that I kind of I just I it was a slow makeover of my life but um I'm now surrounded by some really really good people that um share those core values I suppose and even though I still you know horse people push themselves we like especially people within the equestrian industry is we for some reason we have this that we, we glamorize not having a day off what why in what other industry do we glamorize not having a day off yes we put our horses first but even when you have kids like your actual children you have a day off from them you send them off to school or you send them off to the grandparents or whatever why don't we do that with horses why is it not the norm with horses why do we think that working seven days a week you know 12 months of the year is a good thing why why do we constantly um talk about that like it's, a, it's something to be really proud of um but unfortunately i felt i probably fell into that um group but since then i um have changed the way i think it, i mean it's it's been a really slow process um and and put a lot more emphasis on how i manage my time how i eat um and the fact that i actually have to look after myself otherwise i'm going to burn out and i do, i still do every now and again but the difference is now is i've got people around me especially my partner who can see when i'm just about to completely burn out he calls my mum and says right you have to go down to um your mum's for a few days i'm cancelling all your lessons and i've got a lovely lady who works for me as well um and she she works with my partner to get my diary cleared because I fit too much in my diary. And um, I go and have a few days off, basically. <laughs> but Yeah, it's crazy, I'm isn't it? Yeah, and, and what what is it about? I see this all the time with riders. I mean, they eventually come to me for some mindset stuff and they're like really stuck and, and maybe they've tried everything else and they get fed up with it. And it's like, okay, fine. You know, I'm, I'm used to being people that do it as a reactive, not a proactive, and that's fine, you know, uh, that's okay, that's changing. But how many of us, and um, you know, be guilty of this one, wander around crippled or, you know, with problems in our bodies, um, or we're overweight, or we're, or we're underweight, or we haven't got the strength or the muscle or whatever it is that we need to be able to ride. But our horse has physio, um, every three months, uh, a massage every month. Uh, they have regular dentist appointments. We look at their nutrition to the nth degree. I even got a message this morning from a friend of mine going, how many scoops of this do you feed your horse? And I went, well, it's not just about that. It's about blah, blah, blah. You know, how much work is in, how much is, and then I answered that. I thought, look at that. You just gave them that answer, didn't you? But, you know, like we know this stuff, don't we? Inside out. Um, you know, we get their saddles checked, we get their bodies checked, we, we, we are so careful about how we look after and manage them. And we're walking around with, you know, like one leg half falling off, um, stressed to the nth degree because we're trying to juggle eight million things at the same time. You know, no, no thought or pause whatsoever. And I love the fact that you, used to, you say it used to be called navel gazing, because you're right, actually, this kind of concept of stopping, reflecting, going inwards, thinking about things. It did, didn't it? It was like, well, that's a waste of time. You didn't see that, but now we know it's really key. So what's been your experience of other people being this way? Because I know you, you've you experienced it and you wanted to drive it for yourself, obviously. But if it was just about you, there's no there's no sort of, for want of a better word, business out of it, is there? There's no, there's no reason why other people would, would come to you or you'd be developing the centre you are or anything like that. So what have you noticed in others that's driving you to help them? Actually, really, I, really similar things to, to what I um, notice in myself. Um, so I, I teach an awful lot of people now, um, and, and it's a whole range of people, but everybody has their struggles. That, that's something that I've really um, come to realize is that everybody, every single person that I teach, every single person in this world has something going on that um, that might be affecting how they deal with their horse, how they ride, um, and just their their day-to-day -day life. 
and a lot of the time people want to come and ride their horse and have a good lesson whether they're competitive or whether it's the um i teach a lovely um boy down the road who's who's got autism um but he's he's part of an education program um but he he comes with he, um, to his lesson every week with something that he probably needs to talk about before he can then focus on his um on his lesson for that week uh, and that's what i found with people coming for their um, lessons and at first i was thinking when i was when i was teaching them i was thinking yeah that's fine i can sit and listen to this but actually it was quite a lot of the time it was stuff that people could do something about um and i read a book called the shed method which i don't know whether you're familiar with it's by a lady called sarah milne Rowe, and the shed method um it's an acronym um so S stands for sleep, H is hydration, E is exercise, D is diet. And a lot of the time, those four things um, were really affecting um, or, or have, were having a huge effect on um, the people who were coming for lessons. You know, they hadn't slept well or they, they felt lethargic or um that you know they weren't hydrated they hadn't eaten in you know oh yes i have i I've, all i've had today is a banana and i'm like it's five o'clock in the evening why haven't you eaten more um and 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 sometimes people talk about it like they're kind of proud and it's like how you're paying me for a lesson um you're expecting your horse to do its best for you so why aren't you bringing your best self to the lesson if it's something that's so controllable like I'm not saying that sleep is controllable because that's something I have massive problems with and I'll probably talk about that in a minute. Um, but hydration, exercise and diet, that is totally controllable by the rider. Um, and then obviously you have the, a whole other branch of self-care um, and I put physiotherapy and just paying attention to your body in that bracket, the self-care bracket. Um, and a lot of the time, oh, I the rider will come with, oh, I'm I really struggle with sitting trot. Okay, well, why do you struggle with sitting trot? The horse has a bouncy trot. Well, you're not going to change that. So what can you do for your body to help your, you be able to sit to the trot? Do you have a sore back? Yes, I have a sore back. Well, why don't you go to a physio and have that seen? But your horse has physiotherapy every month. You, and you, you don't hesitate to that, but you... you don't want to pay for yourself to go to physiotherapy we've got to encourage we've got to make this the norm that instead of thinking that it's all about the horse go go and see a physiotherapist go in or go and have um a mechanical horse lesson and see whether your um your weight distribution is even um there are so many controllable things that can make us better for our horses but for some reason we just don't do them we do it we do everything for our horses and we absolutely should i agree that we should horse welfare is has to be top of the list on our priorities but so does rider welfare and it's got to be normalized yeah i think it's really interesting as well and certainly from my perspective as a mindset coach as well is that um if we were a cyclist we couldn't blame it on the bike yeah. because the bike is a static thing okay yeah there's elements of the bike that you can improve to make it lighter or more aerodynamic or more comfortable or whatever they need that's fine um but there is only a certain amount of that that could be the bike the rest of it has got to be the athlete and so so much attention is put on that you know swimming any any um tennis golf anything that that is a single person sport in that respect that everything's put on the athlete isn't it and yet in our sport because we've got another sentient being in there we can go oh well you know i'll make sure they're all right and i won't worry about me but if you were in a figure skating partnership or a dance partnership or something like that and you were aiming for the top you wouldn't just look at one of the partners would you you wouldn't just look at one half of the equation and go well they can have all the support they need but i'm going to just expect them to carry me through and yet we do that with horses don't we we kind of go oh well i'll do everything i can for them because i love them but actually, you could be neglecting them. I'm going to say this now. You could be neglecting that horse by not looking after yourself properly. That's a I mean, wow. Putting it because as soon as you bring the N word in neglect, um, <clears throat> you know, alarm bells ring. It's, it, you know, there are so many obviously negative connotations to the word neglect, but the, the, a lot of the time riders are neglecting themselves. And it's not just, I, I teach a fair few professionals now, and I know how busy it is. And I, I believe me, I know. Um, but 
but you if you if something really matters you make time you really do make time but also the other thing that i find people do is they put so much pressure on themselves to do ever you know they see all these things on facebook and on instagram and think oh i should be doing that with my horse but actually you don't need to do that with your horse you need to go and to make time to do a yoga session or um or you know just go and sit and read a book if you don't want you know go, do something for yourself not just for your horse go, go and um look after yourself and that's that that's that was a big thing for me learning um so it's something i really want to use the welfare center or i call it a welfare wellness center um to promote is um is self-care i mean and and, and it does it comes it's a huge umbrella um, of huge, loads of things come under the self-care umbrella. Um, but I, I, I don't sleep well at all. Um, I, none of the women in my family sleep well at all. And I, I'd read um, the shed method that I mentioned earlier and sleep is the first one. And so I was, I was putting pressure on myself to sleep, which doesn't work. Like you can't, you, you just can't um, force yourself to sleep. Um, so, and, and I was still, even when I'm, I wasn't sleeping well, I was still trying to make sure that I did the exercise and I did all my work and, you know, I was really disciplined in everything that I did. But if you've just had two hours sleep, it's physically impossible to be as productive as on a day when you've had eight hours sleep. I mean, that's, that would be a, a miracle for me. But um, I, you know, on, on the days when I slept probably six hours, I feel so much better. So in, I, I started it, thinking of it um, as diet, exercise and self-care. So even if I've had a really, really rubbish night's sleep, um, I might, instead of getting up and doing a yoga session in the morning, um, I'll get up and read a book or, you know, do something that isn't quite as, um, I don't know, active or pressurized or whatever. I do something that I want to do as a, and, and use that time um, for me instead of feeling like I have to do something. Um, and I think a lot of us equestrians get, um, we get so caught up in what we have to do. And most of it in, involves our horses and not us as people. And, and the important thing is, is that we've got to, we, we would never treat, you know, or nowadays, we never treat horses as you know, all the same. Every We treat every horse as an individual, and we've got to recognise that every person, every rider, every equestrian is an individual. And, you know, you can't just put um, everybody in the same bracket and say, you know, or see someone in it on social media or Instagram and think they're doing that, so I should probably do that as well. Um, because a lot of it's not sustainable, and it's worse for you if you do um, put pressure on yourself to um, to live up to other people's expectations and, and your expectation of what you think life should be like with horses, um, rather than just taking care of yourself. And it's, it's uh, I, I've made up my own little acronym, which is DESK, which is diet, exercise and self-care um, that I, I've written down numerous times now for myself. and. And actually it does help because I don't, I don't put the pressure on myself to sleep now. And, and I don't sit, lie there stressing if I've only had two hours sleep and I'm thinking, oh my God, I've got a million things to do tomorrow. Actually, I can just sort out my diary. I'm very lucky to be in control of my diary. I do the things I have to do, but actually I don't do anything else. Amazing. Okay, great. So, so what I love when I was listening to you talking there, I mean, so far everything you've been talking about actually is controlling the controllables always so it's like okay you don't have to be everyone else you don't have to do the same thing everyone else is doing we've all got different lives we've all got different things some of us are lucky enough well not lucky we're not lucky we have designed our lives to be able to flex our diary or have complete control over what we're doing other people have got day jobs that that contribute a lot more to that other people have got families and things that obviously come into that and, and a lot more um and what i'm hearing from you is okay yeah that's fine everyone's an individual but what can you take some control over? What can you make a decision to do? What can you 
decide you want to change and what can you do to make that happen and you know you don't we're not going to boil the ocean you're not going to suddenly you know have this amazing diet exercise plan self-care all this stuff comes in like in a week yep done it smashed it good like you say it takes a long time doesn't it you said it's taken you a long time on that journey what are some of the learnings on that journey that have been real key pivotal moments for you that have been like the right okay i've got to listen to this or a light bulb type moment um well, the, the first one was standing on the scales and seeing how much weight I'd lost. Um, and for some, I, don't, I don't know why, for some reason, it's that's just that's all that's the first thing to go with me is the diet. Um, so I think the, the most important thing is, is knowing yourself um, and knowing your if, if you do um, spiral like I do. Um, and, and, and by the way, you this is why you must never judge other people is because you have no idea what is going on inside somebody else and unfortunately i've lost um two friends in the last year to suicide which is just horrendous um and and, and on the outside they're, they're such um outgoing fun bubbly people that seemingly have everything but actually they're just they're struggling so much inside and i'm not for the, i'm not saying that i've been anywhere close to that but for even if the people that i was living with didn't know what was going on with me um just before i lost all this weight and, and totally i just i did have a breakdown um then, then imagine someone that you see every day, just, just ask them how they are. And they might just say, they might not want to talk about it. Um, so that's, that's another big side of what I believe in and, and what I want to promote with the, um, with the wellness center. Um, and, I, and we could go down that, I'm not going to go down that road now, but um, my point is just, it's, it's really individual. You've got, you've got to know what your, um, uh, what the signs are of you when you're struggling um because unless you know to recognize them you you don't know how to, you you can't change them you have to identify them first and then um then you can change them so if i i'm being really good and strict with my, i've just been in hospital um for something completely unrelated I, I had some surgery but um i came out of hospital and i thought right i'm going to take serious control of my diet now um and eat as healthily um as i can which actually is really easy because i work from home for me so for me this is really easy um i appreciate it's not as easy for other people i took control of the of my diet um i'm basically just eating as, as many vegetables as i can i'm reading a book called how to have the energy and i can't remember who it's by I'm, i i have to research everything i can't just um i i, I literally have to i'm i'm like a sponge <laughs> i research as much as i can possibly i get read as much as i can and watch as much as i can um so obviously i had to read about how to make my diet better um so I am eating as many vegetables as I can, um, lean meat, cottage cheese, you know, all of that kind of stuff. But equally, on the other hand, if I feel like having chocolate biscuits for lunch, then I just have a few chocolate biscuits for lunch and I don't feel guilty about it. I don't punish myself um, and feel guilty about it because that's the other thing. Why, why, do, why do we end up feeling guilty for taking time to, or, you know, eating a few chocolate biscuits when actually the majority of what we eat is good? um it's like the 80 20 rule yes, that one though isn't it if 80 percent of what you're doing is great you can have 20 yeah. percent perfectly okay <laughs> you know it's, it's when it's the other way around that it's not quite so ideal yeah so yeah okay and i think you know what i'm hearing from you then is like you have to know what your struggles are and yeah. what to do about them you need to spot your signs that perhaps you're headed down that route or spot spot things that you know you go oh hang on but the only way to know those is to have been through them. So often when we see successful people like yourself and what you're doing and, and, and what you're talking about, and people go, oh, well, you know, that's all very well for her. She's got it easy, hasn't she? But, but to get to that point, every single entrepreneur, every single successful person I've spoken to, every single one of these interviews, they've been through struggle because they've had to learn from the struggle what to do about it you don't learn what to do about it unless you're in the struggle you don't go and get the books and research it unless you have a need to do that so you know exactly. all these people that are out there 
saying, oh, you know, you do this and you do that. If they haven't been through that struggle, then they're just they're just regurgitating someone else's really, aren't they? And that's OK. You know, fine. But finding the people like yourself that that, you know, you know this because you've lived it. And you're telling people this because you care and you're passionate and you don't want them to have to go through the struggle that you went through. What you're doing is shortcutting for them. You're saying, look, I went through this lots of times and I learned things that I don't want to have to learn again. I've learned those. I'm now implementing something. I'd rather you didn't have to again and again and again. You know you've got an issue now. Let's sort it now because I can tell you I've, done, I've been there. I've done that research. Mm. Um, it was real. It worked. And, and I love that. I love that, that there's people, so many people out there going. I will help you shortcut this. Mm. Like, come to me, learn what it is you need to learn, because I've been there and I don't want everyone else having to go through it in that same way. Would you agree? Yeah, well, you, this is, but that's why you have um, coaches. That's that's why you have um, riding instructors is so that that's why you go to a coach so that, and that they can pass on their knowledge to you, to you. And it's not, they have that knowledge, not because they've never struggled in their life before, but because they have struggled and they go, oh yeah, my, a horse that I rode three years ago um, had exactly the same problem as that. And we did this, you use their experience and their knowledge um, to deal with your horse. So that's what we've got to do with people as well now. And it's just changing people's mindset. And to, you know, people, the good thing about competitive equestrian especially is that we're, they're so open to learning. Like we, they have this thirst for knowledge. And all we've got to do is flip it on its head and say, okay, you, you've got this thirst for knowledge about horses. What about the other side of the partnership? Why aren't you, you know, craving for knowledge, as much knowledge um, about how your body works and how you can work in conjunction with your horse? Um, the professionals especially, I find I, I, there's, four or five professionals that I work with um, and we go, you know, I go over to their yard and we do maybe four or five, six sometimes horses in a row and they'll do that without a break. You know, that's 45 minute sessions, boom, 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 boom. Their groom has it ready. It's already been on the walk or they don't even do the warming, you know, the um, walking themselves. Um, and then the groom gets on to cool down. That, that, that takes some serious um, fitness and energy. And, 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 and they're, they're, they want to learn so much about um, how to make that particular horse better. Well, actually, there's a common thread most of the time through all, um, okay, so one rider, none of the horses bend to the right. Why do you think that might be? Are you crooked? Yeah, probably. Do you go and see a physio? No. Do your horses have physio? Yes. Does the physio say the same thing every single time that it's tight through its right, um, through the right side of its neck and its left lumbar on the diagonal? Yes. Well, why don't you go and see a physio? Why don't you go and get straightened out? Why don't you put a little bit more um, emphasis on what you can do for the partnership um, rather than, um, you know, just trying to learn, it's fact, learn as much as you like about horses, but just don't, don't neglect the, the other side of the partnership. So we're on that note, tell us what it is, because you've got this really exciting development going on. So we've talked about your why, we've talked about what you're passionate about, um, and you could just have a yard, couldn't you? Like you so easily could just have a yard, but oh no, 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 <laughs> you're doing more than that. Tell us, tell us what this fantastic vision is that you've got. Um, so it's, I wanted a play, actually it was born probably from a selfish, um, point of view originally because I, um, was, I was going to as much as I could. I was, I was doing as much fitness as I could, um, myself, um, whether it was going to the gym or my other half was horrible and, um, I was getting ready for a, a charity race. He, um, he's an ex jockey and he made me cycle up the hill outside our house, which is, oh, it's so steep on a bike without a saddle. So things like that. So I was doing my best to, um, to keep fit, but actually it's so, it is difficult when you're so pressed for time and you can't, I, I have this awful thing of, I can't say no to people. I really struggle to say no to people. So in a point where actually I should probably should be out going for a walk with the dogs or, 
you know, making time for myself, I was saying, yes, of course we can do, we can squeeze in enough, another lesson. Um, so I thought it'd be really nice to be able to have a space here where I could have somebody come to me uh, and on a dedicated day, then I'm committed, I have to do it then, um, or, you know, a dedicated time each day. Um, and I want to do Pilates, I want to do yoga, I want to do more strength and conditioning work. Um, and I thought, actually, the, the bungalow where we used to live, we've just lucky enough to have built a new house on the same property right behind the yard and then the little bungalow that we used to live in has the perfect spaces to be able to run small kind of intimate um not ideal with covid admittedly but hopefully we'll be through that by the time we open um uh small intimate pilates sessions and the same space can be used for education so um we'll deck it out with um tables and chairs and uh, we've got a nice big screen in there already and uh everything that we need for education but also provide yoga mats and all that kind of thing for when we've got it. i've got so many good um uh teachers yoga instructors pilates instructors and other people that i'm desperate to learn from but trying to get to them at the moment is really especially at the moment is really difficult so if they came here, um, I thought that would be brilliant, wouldn't it, for me? But then I started talking to all of my clients and they were saying, oh my God, that would be amazing if we could just come here and do a, a, a yoga or Pilates session or do um, have an evening talk, you know, whether it's a sports psychology talk or a dietitian or something like that. The focus is always going to be on the rider. It's not the horse. My yard focuses on the horse, but this um, little wellness center is going to focus solely on the rider. And then I thought, actually, it'd be really good play, good if we could have a, a therapy um, room as well. So one of the bedrooms is being, one of the old bedrooms is being converted into a therapy room. Um, obviously it's got temperature control. Um, I've got a really good hydraulic um, therapy couch on order and, um, lighting control all of that kind of thing um so that when physiotherapists who treat the horses come here most of the time they 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 treat the riders as well anyway so if they could treat the horses and then the riders directly after and maybe doing a little assessment in the arena to see how they sit and all that kind of thing that surely that's going to be better for the rider and it means that they um they don't have to travel anywhere else other than the yard um to uh, go and have their therapy session um and i'm a big believer I'm, i try and be as open-minded as i can about um different types of therapy as well so if um if there's somebody who wants to come and try out uh different kind you know reiki and all that kind of thing i absolutely feel you know i'd, I'd love to have them here um i don't i try not to um you know, pigeonhole people and in, 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 into, I, I don't, I, I don't want to think of people as being airy fairy. I, I don't, I want to encourage as many different kinds of therapies and different ways of dealing with um, people's struggles, I suppose, because, you know, Reiki works for some people, but it might not work for other people. Um, and everyone is an individual. We've got to remember that everyone's an individual, like I said earlier, but if we just limit ourselves to, you know, oh no, we're only having physiotherapists here. Um, actually, I think we're going to miss a whole load of um, equestrians that might not benefit from, a, you know, being pulled about by a physio. I'm not saying that physiotherapists pull you about. If you have a good one, then they do an amazing job. Um, but some people benefit from more gentle um, therapies and I, I want this place I, I want the the wellness center to be that I want it to be all inclusive I don't want to um, to neglect anybody I suppose it's that n-word again the, the neglect I don't want to neglect anyone and leave them out um, so we're going to focus mostly on um, education and wellness in terms of diet and exercise but also I want to promote the self-care um, and, and therapies as well and make sure everybody, every rider is looking after themselves as best they can. Oh, wow, it's giving me goosebumps. That's so exciting. Isn't that just amazing that, you know, I am 100% on board with you there. It is, the word holistic people think is lofty, but it's not. The word holistic means the whole picture. 
yeah the whole picture mind body emotions spirit you know even if you want to go down that route that you know like it's it's so important that all of this stuff is addressed in a way that works for that person um and when it does and when it starts coming into alignment that's when we feel the sense of flow and things get a bit easier and the path of this resistance starts to come in and it's like oh i can breathe now you know because whatever modality they needed at that time was available for them to even just try i mean that's the lovely part of yours is if you're holding this stuff people can go oh, i've always been really interested in that i'll, I'll pop along and, and i'll try it and you never you you don't know unless you try do you you might find the most random therapy is the one that finally gets to the bit you've been trying to do for ages yes. you know <laughs> i mean haven't we all found this our same instructor says the same thing again and again and again and again and then we go to a new instructor for a clinic or something or that someone goes oh can i have a lesson with me or something and they say something you come back and you go oh this amazing thing and it's sorted this and you're just because oh, i've been telling you that for years and you haven't listened to it and it's like you just need it in a different way sometimes don't you and you know that's that's the lovely thing about having the buffet available so you can try a little bit of stuff and see what works for you and i think that sounds to me like what you're trying to deliver is just um a space where people can work out what it is that works for them yes yeah that's a really good way of looking at it trying to get um people to come and experiment i suppose a little bit and um and get to know themselves and get to know what works for them um and i suppose in a way it's kind of what we do with horses as well you know we we won't settle just on one how many different types of feed are there we don't settle just on one type of feed we do as much research as we can into which type of feed they need and then they we see whether they like it or not and sometimes they don't like it my horse won't eat anything other than the most expensive feeds at the moment apparently um but we gave him the choice of however many different feeds before he settled on the one that he liked um and i think we need to do the same for ourselves and and don't feel guilty for being a little bit fussy about and, and saying actually that didn't work for me um because what works for one person might not work for you it might it, it, you know and and uh you know some people might find that pilates works really well for them um but other people find that yoga works really well or going for a really good long run works better for them um it's all i, I want people to be able to yeah do some experimenting i suppose <laughs> give them the buffet <laughs> that sounds really okay cool. <laughs> So we have, we've talked a lot about you and what's inspired you on your journey and things. We haven't really kind of um, gotten so much into your, you know, your riding or any side of that, because actually that's not quite so relevant to this today. But, um, you know, you have done, like you say, you've done a lot of things. But I want to know who's inspired you along the way? Who have been the people that you have looked up to or been inspired by or gotten some great nugget of knowledge from as you've gone through your journey to get to where you are? Oh, that's a good question. Um, if you'd asked me 10 years ago, I would have told you, I would, I would have reeled off probably the British eventing team or something like that because it, I was so driven um in my eventing but actually now um i feel like i'm a slightly more uh, um I, I feel like my mindset is a little bit broader than it was maybe 20 years ago um so now i think probably actually my one of my biggest inspirations is my dad um he he you know he does things that it, it, he's in motor racing my family aren't horsey they're not remotely horsey dad's in motor racing my sister's in australia with him um also working in motor racing and absolutely killing it so dad but dad's defeated the odds so many times over the course of his life um and my sister as well is is a huge inspiration because she she's um breaking through in a, in a in a really male dominated industry um and and actually killing it and she's doing a law degree as well and she's you know she's on telly out there she's um doing a bit of broadcasting um and um and so yeah my my dad and my sister but also my mum my 
um, my mum's a huge inspiration, um, mostly because, you know, whenever I, if, if I ever um, need to call her, then, she, you know, she's always there to, to speak to me. And that's kind of how I want to be for the people that I really care about in my life as well. Um, and I try and try and approach things um, like that, you know, with with a lot of kindness um, and open mindedness. Um, and my mum has been a huge support. Um, you know, while I was ill a couple of weeks ago, she came and lived here and I was and she she really did look after me and every single little craving or, or whim I had. She went and she catered for, which was very good of her. Um, but in terms of, you know, the broader um, people that inspire me. Um, Adam Kemp has been a huge inspiration um, in, for people who might not know. He's a he's a dressage trainer and coach, um, but also he's ridden um, internationally, Grand Prix dressage rider, um, and he's he's helped me a hell of a lot. Uh, so I think I first met him in 2014, just as I was um, just as I was recovering from um, from you know the weight loss and all of everything that was going on um and so he's literally seen me at my very lowest and sat there and listened and nodded and gone yeah okay well we can now that you've got all of that off your shoulders now we can train your horse um so yeah he's he's helped a hell of a lot um and actually my other half um now inspires me every day because he is the hardest working person in the world he's an, like i said he's an ex-jockey um he works really really hard um and actually it's mostly for me it's supporting me um i i don't i don't pay him <laughs> to, to, you know he empties the muck trailer for us he does all the field maintenance he looks after the all the um the fencing and all that kind of stuff. anything goes wrong here then then he sorts it out um but so I, I think it's it's more immediate people now that inspire me um to be uh, i sound a bit cheesy but be the best version of me that i can be um rather than looking at at, at people that are too far away to really see the real person i i'd like to think all those people that i've just listed i know quite well um and i know all the sides to them whereas the the people that i used to look up to yeah you can look up to these people you know um i found you look up to like i love i love the blogs that piggy french march is doing um it's i mean and she's she's really um open and honest i think on them and she comes across um with integrity and that's something I think is really important and you don't see very often on social media. But um, I try not to, uh, I suppose, look too much into people who are constantly posting on social media. I, I try not to, I, I try to um, pull my inspiration from people closer to home, I suppose. Sorry, I hit the wrong button. <laughs> I'm back. I'm back. Um, amazing. Yeah. And, and thank you. And even just in being so honest about that, that actually, you know, your inspiration doesn't have to be someone at the top of their game at that point in time. They can be someone closer to home. They can be someone who's working hard to try and get there. They can be someone who's overcoming challenges. You know, your your inspiration, you know, so often I ask that question, someone says something like, oh, you know, Charlotte de Jardin or Michael Ewing or something or, you know, and it's a bit like, um, okay that's fine like by all means aspire to be them but you know how many people are going to be them what is it about them that inspires you and that's the most important thing and then when you start realizing what it is about someone that inspires you you start realizing there's lots more people with that quality that actually are closer to you and they're probably more influential in fact they are more influential the closer they are to you the more influential they are okay so let's start wrapping this up with just a simple easy question for you where do you see yourself in 10 years time um hopefully still here um at ridgeway view um and hopefully doing almost the same as i'm doing now i have to say probably in 10 years time um i want to be going at a slightly slower pace possibly um and having a little bit more 
control, I suppose, over how much I do, because I, I think I probably I will have to slow down a little bit more. But I, I still want to be as, as uh, I suppose, mentally busy, but just prob probably not as physically as busy. You know, I've just before nine o'clock this morning, I'd already exercised three, done a yoga session and um, worked on my business plan. So maybe slow down a little bit. But I still want to be helping horses and riders. I love what I do. I absolutely adore working with horses and riders. I'd still like to be competing. I want to have bought that really, really, that one really nice horse for myself by then. Hopefully, if I could bring myself to spend a bit of money on a horse for once for myself. Um, but pretty much doing the same as what I'm doing now. Is that a really boring answer? No, I think that's gorgeous. No, absolutely. Because that, well, that's fine. If you love what you're doing, carry on doing it. Like You don't have to change. Um, <laughs> and I love, I absolutely love what you said there about, um, I want to be mentally busy and still creating an impact, a ripple but not necessarily having to do it all myself. And I think this is really key that so many people, and oh my word, I've been stuck in this one so often as well, that you can have a massive impact. And just by you talking on here, you're gonna have an impact on lots of people thinking about something differently. But by doing something in a clever way, not necessarily having to do it all yourself. So you do not have to go and teach all those people to have that impact. You can go and have that impact by you know, your centre is going to do its thing. You, you open that space for other people to come in and influence others. It doesn't have to be you doing the doing. And I think in our industry, you know, because there is a lot of manual side to it a lot of the time, people think that they have to be the one doing the teaching or be the one running the yard or be the one doing the mucking out or be the one doing the travelling or whatever it is. They have to be doing it, but they don't. You can have an incredible impact, an incredible ripple effect with that one drop. In fact, that's, that's what this actually is around my neck. This is a thing oh. called a one drop. I was looking and at it's that. a one drop yeah it's it is actually a one drop that um an incredible mentor of mine um she's created these to remind us all that we are one drop and that if you can have one drop and the ripple effect that that has on others that is more powerful and more impactful on the world than trying to do it all yourself you're gonna burn out been, been there done that one got the burnout t-shirt no thank you very much not doing yeah. that again you know and you're the same and i think what I love about you is the fact you've, you're so passionate, you're so driven, but at least you're beginning to realise now it doesn't have to be you. You can orchestrate it. You know, look at the leaders of massive, incredible companies, incredible charities, incredible organisations that are out there. They're not on the ground doing it all the time. They might do occasionally because they want to be involved. They are leading others to create that impact. So how many people can you inspire just by even having watched this? you know, listening to this podcast, watching this now, how many people can you inspire to think about the other 50% of that partnership? There's your ripple, there's your effect. And you don't have to have been up and done 8 million things in the morning before you have that effect. You can just have that one drop by putting that message out there. And I really want to help you spread that message. I think it's so important. So I'm sure oh. there'll be some collaborations and things to come. Uh, it's great to talk about it as well, because it's it's been in my head for so long and it's actually great to, to get it out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely it's no good in your head it needs to be out there it needs to be out there you're not going to create any impact in your own head so um one of the questions that's come up and and people are saying wow this is really exciting i love this well done will you be doing retreat type breaks for people to come with their horse and enjoy all the benefits i might have missed it but no you didn't miss it it will you be doing that is that on the agenda yeah so um yeah. it is <laughs> um it will probably be uh, the first one I'm hoping will be towards the autumn. Um, we, we need to get the make sure that the COVID restrictions and everything for obvious reasons are out of the way. Um, but before that, we're going to be doing day camps. And I'm hoping that the first one will be in July, um, if all goes to plan with a, a little bit of building and internal works um, on the bungalow. Um, and I'm hoping that uh, we can do, within those day camps, we can do maybe two ridden sessions in the day. Um, one, maybe focusing more on position and how the rider interacts with the horse. Um, and then the second one, more of a, a, a horse um, focused one. So maybe pole work session or test riding or something like that. I haven't figured out the finer details of it yet. Um, but 
within that, I would love to, within that day, I'd love for um, small groups of people, and it will only ever be probably anything up to eight people in, in, involved in one day. There won't be millions of people here. So maybe in groups of two to sit down and with someone like you, Jenny, and, and have a, um, a chat about uh everything that we've talked about today basically and 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 being the best for our horses that we can possibly be uh whether it's to do with mindset or diet or exercise self-care um but i want that to become the norm um for people so you you do your you know you do your position work you do your work on the horse you have fun with your horse it, the whole thing has to be fun but also i want i, I just want it to be normal that you treat the rider as well as you treat the horse because quite often on these camps and things you have an you know a, a, an equine dietitian coming in or a farrier or a vet or whatever fabulous I, I would never um say that we don't need any of those things the more we educate people about horse welfare the better however we need to still include the rider in all of that and that's what i hope to do for my in my camps but event yeah we'll be doing um like two day ones eventually, two or three day ones eventually. But at the moment, well, we've got COVID and everything, we'd have to stick to the one day ones. Oh, so exciting. And I love, I mean, and I know you're not the only one doing this, um, you know, but I love the fact that you are doing it. And, and you know, we need people all around the country, all around the world, in fact, doing this kind of thing, really, don't we? Because, you know, we, can't, we don't want to be travelling our horses for eight or nine hours to come to a day camp. We, we actually physically need people nearby us. So the, the concept of this centre is huge yeah hopefully <laughs> it's a effect. cool well thank you so so much Alex. it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you and thank you for being so honest with us and telling us about your story and your hopes and vision for the future um how do people get a hold of you or get in touch if they want to know more or they want to sign up to be on your mailing list for camps or anything like that how do they get in touch so um my business is called hurston dressage and eventing that's h-u-r-s-t-o-n dressage and eventing and that's on facebook um and the new the the equestrian center i should have said this earlier this is i'm rubbish at this um the new wellness center is the whole concept of it is going to be called the conscious equestrian um and a facebook site for that will be launched fairly soon i've got one of my lovely friends working on a logo for me at the moment um and we're still in that we've just incorporated it as a uh, limited company so we're still very much in the um early stages of it being developed but um if you keep an eye on the hurston dressage and eventing page my other business um we will obviously tell everybody as soon as the um, facebook site is live for the conscious equestrian and um we'll start posting on there as soon as possible i've got so many ideas and things <laughs> I love the conscious equestrian. I think that's such a gorgeous name. It's so true, isn't it? It's about being conscious of your decisions and being conscious of the the all the little bits that make the big difference. And oh my god, I love that. I gave you goosebumps. <laughs> conscious question. I think that's gorgeous. Thank you so much, Ali. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on board. I can't wait to see everything that's going to unfold in the future. Hopefully, be a part of it as well. I'd love to support you with it. And. Um, yeah, so thank you so much, and uh, I'm sure lots of people will be in touch soon. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.